everyone, I just wanted to throw out before the video starts that if you want me to come on your podcast, want me to talk about sports, video games, really anything, I can do that. Uh, if you want me, if you want to appear on my podcast, please let me know. If you want to sponsor, please let me know. I should be reachable. I will put at the end of this video the email and all contacts for the program. Uh, with that being said, please enjoy the video and please let me know about any questions, either on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. And if you're listening on SoundCloud, please head over to one of those and send me a quick email or anything. So talk to you guys later. Sports Talk. Uh, once again, I am your host, Byro. Uh, if you haven't noticed from my hat, I am working on a house currently, and that's where I'm recording and will be recording in the future. So once again, short explanation. Um, this is a sports show. I pre-record. I'm actually, I was going to I tweet out, but I forgot my phone. Uh, however, I will right now list it. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, SoundCloud, YouTube. I uh, could not get iTunes to work, so those are the platforms I will be doing in the near future. So let's get started on this edition of Byro Sports Talk. So... This will be posted a day after today, but happy 4th of July, and a shout out to my old co-host on Straight Football Talk, Ted Tate, and his lovely wife's anniversary being on 4th of July. Um, but the big news today I wanted to address was Joey Chestnut winning his 10th mustard belt in the hot dog eating contest. He downed 72 dogs. His previous best in a qualifier was 73 and a half. His previous best at the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest was 70. So just getting better. He, there was a rival. His name was Carmen Sincata. And he got 60. If the name's wrong, please tell me. Again, you can comment on the video. Reach out on Twitter. Comment on YouTube, Facebook. Again, please reach out. Uh, so what I want to do moving forward, now that I've addressed the big event today on 4th of July, I would like to get a Q&A session for this opening bit. Uh, I wouldn't mind doing a live Q&A either on a Thursday or on a Monday or a Tuesday. Um, tell me what you guys think. I Instead of, say, it will be live on Facebook, but it will be pre-recorded into the show. That way, people can have somewhat of a live Q&A. So, the next part, first thing I want to talk about, NBA Free Agency Frenzy. There's been a lot of movement. Uh, the first movement I want to talk about, which was great for the Oklahoma City Thunder, the team I like. Russell Westbrook got another good small forward coming to his way when Paul George is coming to town. It may be a one-year rental, but hey, it can only be positive. The thing I did not like about the trade, I understand Victor Oladipo needing to be in this trade. The person I didn't like in this trade was Sabonis' son, 
to Montez Sabonis. He had upside. I think he would have been a great power forward of the future. However, we do have Ennis Kantner, and we also had uh, Steven Adams, and both are very, very good. Uh, Taj Gibson also ended up moving, but I will talk about him later. I uh, just this trade overall is a win for the Thunder. Uh, the Celtics tried everything to try to get Paul George. The Lakers offered Jordan Clarkson two draft picks in the draft, and they denied it. But yet they got Victor Oladipo, Sabonis, and I believe a future first rounder. So that was the first big trade, along with Chris Paul being traded to the Houston Rockets. Now, I'll touch base on this a little bit and go a little deeper in it when I start doing some team specifics. But So Chris Paul was traded. The Clippers got Patrick Beverly, one of the brightest point guards. That I mean, he's only going to get better. The Sam Decker, if you don't remember who he is, he was part of Wisconsin's uh, run to the national championship game. They didn't win, of course. <laughs> Losing to Duke, but moving on. They got Hartz Montrell Hazel. And again, I'm trying to go off the top of my head. There was a I believe a fourth member of that trade, and right off the bat, I can't think of who that is. However, just Beverly, they, they got some pieces, and these pieces, I think, are very well happening. They did re-sign Blake Griffin. I mean, that's just great, but let's look at some other free agent signings, starting with the Golden State Warriors. So, David West, ring chaser. Se or Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, Andre Iguodala, Sean Livingston. The biggest concern this offseason was how uh, Livingston and Iguodala and David West would be complimented on this team if they would even return to the team. Well, it's safe to say all five returned. And, I mean, good for them, bad for the rest of the league, I guess. This, the Golden State Warriors aren't changing anytime soon, and with Jordan Bell drafted to them, they're just going to get better. Uh, I think all these signings are great. I don't see an issue with any for them, and I mean, obviously, they're going to try to repeat as champions. The next team I want to talk about, the Minnesota Timberwolves, they had the big draft night trade of Jimmy Butler, but... They had two signings so far this free agency that were pretty big. Taj Gibson, who I mentioned for the Thunder, left. Uh, Jeff Teague of the Pacers, who left to go to Minnesota. Now, both these guys, very good veterans. They may not be all-stars in a sense, but they're very good, solid starters on any team they play. And with Jimmy Butler, Carl Anthony Towns, um, Andre Wiggins, and I mean, they're just going to get better and better, and Minnesota's probably going to be pushing for a playoff berth this year. If they don't, it's going to be interesting to see what happens after that. The Houston Rockets, another great, again, they got Chris Paul, but some of these signings, Nene, P.J. Tucker, the Zoo Key was a little weird to me. I don't remember him playing, but Tucker's been a solid shooter throughout his career, and Nene is a great rebounder. And with a fast-paced offense, that's kind of what you need in both areas. Um, a few other play players I wanted to mention through this free agency. Uh, Kyle Korver returning to the Cavs. Uh, I was a little shocked by that, but at the same time, it is what it is. Um, J.J. Redick is going to the 76ers. Uh, again, shocked by it, but he's, he's making a very young team better. And he's bringing leadership, and he's bringing his shooting ability 
to a team that needed a great shooter. And Nick Stauskas may be revitalized with J.J. Redick there teaching him, grooming him to be a J.J. Redick-esque player. Um, the biggest two signings of another team for the Kings of all teams, getting big names, Zach Randolph and George Hill. If you don't remember these two names, Zach Randolph is a Memphis Grizzly veteran who plays hard, rebounds hard, and honestly haven't been hearing a lot of him in the last few years, but always, always a solid player. And for him to go to the Kings, that just makes them better. George Hill, again, another solid player. He was best known with his time with the Pacers. He was a great compliment there, and a lot of people, like me, remember him on the Spurs where he was a decent player. Uh, again, he was always been decent, very solid point guard, and going to be helping the Kings and helping De'Aaron Fox become better. The Pelicans retained their point guard, Drew Holiday, who's yet to return to all-star status like he was back with the 76ers. Again, it's all interesting to see how it's been played out. Serge Ibaka staying with the Raptors. Again, another solid player. Last year was a terrible year for him. But going from the Magic and getting traded to the Rockets, it's crazy how a year changes people's minds about a player. And another one I wanted to mention was Paul Millsap going to the Nuggets, a team that's always scary consistent. And I say scary consistent because you think they have a down year and they're somehow the eighth seed making the playoffs. And now to have a all-star Paul Millsap go to their team is huge. And I don't mean huge, but huge. Uh, the trade that's currently in the works, Danilo Gallinari of the Nuggets being traded to the Clippers. Uh, I mean, now that Paul Millsap's there, they don't need him as much. And the talks of the trade is Jamal Crawford, Diamond Stone, and a future first rounder going to the Hawks. The Hawks giving assets to the Nuggets, and the Nuggets, of course, giving off Gallinari to the Clippers. The I think it's a great trade. Uh, Jamal Crawford came out and said he would love to play with Lonzo Ball at the Lakers, though. So, depending on how the Hawks work in this trade with him, it'll be interesting. I seeing Jamal Crawford and seeing him potentially going to the Hawks. I don't think it's a great fit for him. I could very well see him getting waived. The Hawks are kind of in a youth movement. You're seeing uh, Dennis Schroeder as the starter after letting Jeff Teague walk, who's, like I said, going to the Minnesota Timberwolves. Uh, you're seeing Tim Hardaway Jr. revitalizing his career. You have Kent Bazemore balling out. I mean, they just let Paul Millsap and Dwight Howard leave. But the Hawks are going to be, again, a decent... I think they'll be a good playoff contender, but not a championship contender. I think they're a low seed at the worst. Moving on from the supposed trade, is Gordon Howard Hayward going to the Celtics? Uh, all talk today has been he is going to the Celtics. However, his agent keeps telling the press there has been no decision made. Utah is the former, uh, the former team. I know the Celtics were the biggest threat to Utah. I can't remember the third team, but I mean it's either the Celtics or it's going to be Utah. And speaking of the Timberwolves, who got Jeff Teague, they traded R Ricky Rubio to the Utah Jazz. And you're looking at the one person on the Utah Jazz who helped that team just become a contender this year, making the playoffs for the first time since 2012 and winning the division title for the first time in since 2008-2007. That's, I mean, Gordon Hayward only gets better each and every year. And the reason why the Celtics are such a hard, 
a hard contender is what how I'll say it is because if you don't remember Gordon Hayward in college basketball, you may remember the program he was part of, and that was Butler Bulldogs. The The championship he was in was the first of two. He was in the first one where they lost to Duke in the finals, and they lost because his last second shot did not go in. And for being a half-court shot, it was basically in, and it rolled out. Now, being the Duke fan I was, or and still am, I was excited, I was happy, and I moved on. Uh, looking back at it now, if you, from a standpoint outside, it was kind of heartbreaking not seeing the underdog program finally rising to the challenge, finally knocking off the Blue Bloods, and to witness it, the same thing the following year where they lost to UConn, and Kemba Walker just running away with them. It was, again, devastating, but that that second year did not involve Gordon Hayward. And we're talking about Gordon Hayward. So the connection, again, with the Celtics, though, if you're not, a, again, if you're someone who's been big in basketball, Brad Stevens, the head coach of Butler, when Gordon Hayward was there. He's the guy who recruited... Gordon Hayward to Butler, and of course, the memes of his eyes during a press conference for Gordon Hayward. I, I mean, it's what it is, but on a more serious note, it just makes sense to go to the Celtics. I hate to say it, but the Jazz needed him to stay. I think he does go to the Celtics. I think the person the personal relationship he has with Brad Stevens is going to help the opportunity to take another step forward to become I would I would say become an all-star but he is an all-star he will keep transcending upward he's got the abilities to keep on progressing keep on becoming a star he's a great shooter he's a great defender he's a great in a sense, a great baller. He plays basketball hard. He plays it well. He's a great shooter. He's a great defender. He does it all for you, without question. And looking at that, you look at his fit with the Celtics. Jay Crowder is the current small forward, and Gordon Hayward would fit right in in place of him. And both players are hardworking players. However... Gordon Hayward is the he is a all-star that can be paired with Isaiah Thomas and with those two alone could once again push the Cavs however the Cavs are just the team to beat in the East and the Celtics are doing whatever they can to beat the Cavs at this point and if you can beat the Cavs you have a chance to beat the Warriors on the West or whoever comes out of the West I say whoever because Houston's destroying the Chris Paul trade is amazing for them. The P.J. Tucker signing is great. Minnesota could be a dark horse team with Taj Gibson, Jeff T. The Thunder, I a lot of people think they're a contender now just because of Paul George, and I have to agree, especially with the Terrence Ferguson shooter at shooting guard potential. The best thing I can say is there's a lot of change coming in this league. And I know for straight football talk, we mentioned it a lot about a time of change. Right now, we're witnessing potential. Everyone is worried at what the Warriors are going to do. And certain teams are banking on the youth movement, say like the 76ers. The Bucks, the the Timberwolves, and other teams like the Cavs, the Thunder, and and the Rockets are just trying to get superstars to compete. Still, the Clippers are probably the team that's been hurt the most, just because their captain, oh captain, Chris Paul left, and they're trying to figure out is. Patrick Beverly going to be the guy? Is Eric, 
Austin Rivers going to be a contributor on offense for a starting role. And with J.J. Redick also leaving and Jamal Crawford leaving, what does that mean for a shooting guard? Do you have P.J. – well, P.J. Tucker's with the Rockets, so he's not going to do it. Jamal Crawford's leaving. He's not going to step up for J.J. Redick. So you, now you have a shooting guard issue. If Austin Rivers moves to shooting guard and you have Patrick Beverly, it may work. But that goes into why – is Austin Rivers so highly valued if he's only a backup? Because of his dad, as Chris Paul would say, and a few others. However, I don't think... I can see that being the issue. Why Chris Paul left, why J.J. Rick left. But I think the Clippers will be a team to watch fall off. They're, if they get Gallinari, I think they will be fine. They just need... Beverly to be a great passer, but you're missing out on a few players that, I mean, I rave about J.J. Redick. I, I will admit, being a Duke fan, he was one of my favorite Duke players. Some people may say, hey, you're crazy. He's one of the most hated Duke players, and so is Grayson Allen, so is Christian Leitner, both of which I'm okay with. Leitner didn't have a great career uh, in the NBA. He was okay, but never really excelled. Uh, and Grayson Allen's still preve preventing himself from entering the league until he feels right. And that's fine. I understand. But let's move on from the, the NBA free agency. I, again, please leave comments. Please ask questions. Please... Save questions even. Again, I'm trying to figure out how... I want to keep pre-recording. I still want questions that come in. I still want interactivity. I Again, there's Twitter. There's YouTube. Just SoundCloud. Listen, watch, do it all. So, moving on. The MLB All-Star Selections. So that... So that happened this past weekend. Let's talk about some of these selections. Um, I hate to say it, I'm not not familiar with a lot of these names, only because the teams I follow, the Indians, I follow a lot. I kind of touched the Rays, but I've kind of grown past following them. And I only follow the Reds because Ohio, in all honesty. So Justin Smoke of Blue Jays was selected as the starting first baseman. The second baseman, Jose Altuve of the Astros, shortstop Carlos Correa of the Astros, also third baseman Jose Ramirez of the Indians. Salvador Perez of the Royals is the starting catcher. The designated hitter is Corey Dickerson of the Rays. Aaron Judge, the biggest name out there right now for the Yankees, is the starting outfielder. Uh, again, he was, he's a rookie. He's dominating the league currently. Mike Trout, now a consensus every year, will be elected to Angels outfielder. Uh, George Springer of the Astros, also outfielder for the starting lineup. Right there's your starting lineup. What do I think? The biggest, I wouldn't say surprise because they were good last year. And I believe they were good the year before, but the Astros have been hot this year. Again, it's not surprising that three of their guys are selected. I'm a little surprised that Francisco Lindor is not a starter, but Jose Ramirez, I'm glad an Indians representative. They're still doing fine this year. Uh, the biggest... Uh, I mean, I'm not really shocked by any of the selections. So far, the Blue Jays guy kind of surprises me just because I haven't been following as well as I have in the past. That's why, I, if I had to pick one, it was the Blue guy, Jays. Uh, I believe it was Justin Smoke. Uh, it's only because I don't know his stats. If I looked into it, I'm sure he would have the stats. And with... Edward and Carson, 
Sion on the Indians and oh yeah, Jose Bautista probably not performing as well. The Blue Jays aren't quite as what they were in the past few years, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, the pitcher selected to the team was Chris Sale of the Red Sox, Dallas Kuchel of the Astros, Irvin Santana of the Twins, Jason Vargas of the Royals, Luis Severino of the Yankees, Hugh Darvish of the Rangers, Michael Fulmer of the Tigers, Corey Kluber of the Indians, Lance McCullers Jr. of the Astros, Craig Kremble of the Red Sox, Andrew Miller of the Indians, and Dellen but Batance Batances of the Yankees. Uh, again, a lot of these not surprised. They do try to balance it for every team does get players selected. And to see the Astros have two representative representatives, the Indians have two, the Red Sox have two, and the Yankees have two. Those teams have been hot and they've been Exciting this year, and again, I'm not surprised by any of those names. It's again, it's more I'm not familiar as I should be, as I have in years past, with some of these names. Uh, Gary Sanchez for the reserves, yeah, catcher reserve Gary Sanchez of the Yankees. Big, big, besides Aaron Judge, I've heard nothing but great things about Gary Sanchez this year. Uh, first baseman Yonder. Alonzo of the A's, second baseman Starlin Castro of the Yankees, the second baseman Jonathan Shoup of the Orioles, third baseman Miguel Sano from the Twins, shortstop Francisco Lindor. Again, I'm more shocked that he's not a starter, but again, he's representing you know, as an all-star, and I'm happy to say that's great for him. Mookie Betts, outfielder for the Red Sox, outfielder Aracel Garcia of the White Sox, Outfielder Michael Brantley of the Indians and Nelson Cruz, designated hitter of the Mariners. Great, great players on the bench. You have great players starting and you have great pitching. Um, to sum it up for the American League, I the names I don't know is only because I'm not following like I used to growing up. Uh, growing up, I was a stats guy. I would be, let's, well, Upper Sandusky was before I turned eight. And as a five, four, six year old, I'm doing multiplication and division because I want to figure out batting averages and figuring out numbers. So, a better way than baseball cards, figuring out how that works. Uh, so, that's my story, but. Again, if I would have looked into these stats a little more this week, trying instead of, you know, fixing my house that I'm not going to show everyone until it's pretty much done. And my wife and I are hard at work at it. And I still thank her every day that she allows me to do this in my spare time. But as we're talking all-stars for the MLB, the National League All-Stars, you have first baseman, first baseman Ryan Zimmerman of the Nationals, second baseman Daniel Murphy of the Nationals, shortstop Zach Cosart of the Reds, third baseman Nolan Arendo of the Rockies, catcher Buster Posey, yeah, name everyone's familiar with, of the Giants, Outfielder, outfielders Bryce Harper of the Nationals, Charlie Blackman of the Rockies, and Marcel Azuna of the Marlins. Uh, the only one I can say I don't know much about was probably Marcelo Asuna. Uh, the Reds are playing above expectations. I'll say a little bit more later about that. Uh, moving on, the, their pitchers for the National League, you have Clayton Kershaw, Dodgers, Max Scherzer of the Nationals, Robbie Ray of the Diamondbacks, Zach Greinke of the Diamondbacks, Carlos Martinez of the Cardinals, Steven Strasburg of the Nationals, Kenley, oh boy, Jens, Jansen of the Dodgers, Greg Holland of the Rockies, Wade Davis of the Cubs, Brad Hand of the Padres, Corey 
Neville of the Brewers and Pat Neshek of the Phillies. And wow, uh, if you haven't heard, Granke, Scherzer, Kershaw, Strasburg, Davis, and those are the ones I'm familiar with, but I'm sure, well, Granke, I think I said, but I'm sure the rest are just as dangerous as those pitchers. Um, again, if you, I hate to say it, but I would love to dig, dive deeper in their stats, dive deeper in how they've been producing, uh, due to time restraints again, work and everything, wasn't able to go into it this week. However, I'm just reading off these names. Again, I feel like a strong contender for the All-Star game. The reserves, you got catcher Yadier Molina of the Cards, Paul Goldschmidt of the Diamondbacks. At first base, you have first baseman Joey Votto of the Reds, who, again, seems to be every year. Uh, second baseman DJ Lamayu of the Rockies. Second baseman Josh Harrison of the Pirates. Third baseman Jake Lamb of the Diamondbacks. Shortstop Corey Seager of the Dodgers. Outfielders. You have Cody Bellinger of the Dodgers. You have Giancarlo Stanton, the home run king of last year's home run derby from the Marlins. And you have Michael Conforto of the Mets in Ender and Narte of the Braves. Um, I know a few of the names, again, National League, just not really where I follow a lot of. A lot of the teams I follow are in the American League. The pitching, though, I think will be the hardest thing in that. So let's dissect these rosters a little bit, just to elaborate and to add some time to the video. So if I had to compare these teams currently and how they're going to compete against each other, I solely believe the American League will win only because of the offensive bats and I say that only because again those are the guys I know more those are the guys I believe in more however Buster Posey, Bryce Harper, Ryan Zimmerman and Daniel Murphy I'm sure Zach Cozart of the Reds being a starter deserves it they are offensive bats too I just with Chris Sale yeah, you look at the pitching. You see Chris Sale, Irvin Santana, Hugh Darvish, Corey Kluber, uh, Alex or Andrew Miller, sorry, Jason Vargas, and then you look at the pitchers for the National League with Kershaw, Scherzer, Granke, Strasburg, Wade Davis, Hand. I mean, oh boy. I, usually the All Star game is about like nine to eight. 11 to 12. Sometimes it's even more ridiculous. I think there's a good balance, honestly. I still I lean towards the American League because of the Indians. Uh, the I look at it and quite frankly, that's all I can I see I see talent everywhere. It's hard for me to just distinguish who I think will win. I am sticking only with the American League because of my fandom. Uh, but please tell me who you guys think. Tell me what, which all-star team you think is going to pull out. Uh, going into the standings of the Major League Baseball currently, the Red Sox are up three and a half games on the Yankees. The In the East, AL East, AL Central, Indians are up two and a half games on the Royals. In the AL West, and by the biggest league, league, the biggest lead by far for any team, the Houston Astros are up 15 games on the Angels currently. In the National League, the Nationals are up eight and a half on the Braves. The in the Central Brewers are up two and a half on the Cubs, eight and a half on the Reds. For you Red fans. The A or the NL West, the Dodgers are up two and a half games on the D-backs, and 
from there, let's talk about these Reds. Uh, I can go on and on about the Indians. They're just doing what they're supposed to be doing. The Reds, let's talk about their record currently. They are 35 and 47. Yes, 35 and 47 as of recording. But let's look at how well they're doing this year. They're 23 and 20 at home. They're winning games at home, and that's amazing for a team that's trying to do a youth movement. To be eight and a half games at this point of the season is amazing for them. They, for last year, just kind of falling off the face of the earth, they are doing great this year. The thing they need to work on is the 12 and 27 from not being at home. You're looking at 43 games at home and 39 right now away. And you're, you're above 500 at home, but away you're not even 25% winning those games. That's, that's just hurtful. They need to pick it up away. Uh, they're a young team. It's expected. When you're trying to build your team, that's the first thing you look at is are you comfortable at home? And luckily for the Reds, they are. And you look at their way, that's where they need to focus is playing away. Even though they're young, they are young. They will get better. And, I mean, Joey Votto is still one of the last pieces that are around that may leave so that the true youth moment, movement happens. Or we'll stay around, be a great contribution to the team, and we'll see. A few other things going on. You see the Gronk logo. Uh, I mean, I'm going to pull it up on the screen. His logo is right now, Nike is saying it's too close to MJ's jump. And quite frankly, yeah, I see the similarities. But I also see a man spiking a football and not slam dunking. I I love the jump man. It's been around for years and years and years and it's iconic in its own right. The fact that I hate to say Gronk is kind of playing off of it. It's kind of funny only because he's a Nike signee. Jordan Brand is a Nike affiliate. So you tell me what's I I personally think I want to want you guys to tell me what you think. I think personally that it's ridiculous it's even coming up in conversation, especially since they're both Nike. However, is it wrong for Gronk's logo to look so similar? And by similar, it's very loosely similar. I'm not trying to sway your decision towards me, but please tell me what you think. Uh, the next topic I, I want to talk about, also coming from the NFL, Jeff Saturday says, if Mitchell Trubisky is just dominating, allow him to compete. For the starting job. I want to take a few minutes talking about this because as a Bears fan, it kind of, it doesn't rub off the wrong way. It kind of, it caused drama that as a Bears fan, we try to avoid. And yes, we didn't want Trubisky right away. Trubisky came out and said, we are playoff bound, but didn't guarantee it. And looking at Glennon in front of him, looking at what Trubisky was able to do at UNC, I have to say, I think a year not in the conversation is what Trubisky needs. I think it's very reasonable to put him as the number two quarterback. Um, 
I think he's worked hard for the consideration to compete, and I think, in all honesty, he will give a sh he will give a shot at competing. However, it's pretty much decided that Glennon's going to be the starter. That Glennon is going to be the one leading us to the playoffs. And do I think we're playoff bound? No. Do I think we're close? Yeah. I think injuries will be the biggest concern. Uh, I think I mentioned it last time. The Bear. Oh no, I mentioned it on Facebook that the Bears' offensive line is ranked fifth in being one of the best in the league. I have to say I believe it with. Jordan Howard bursting on the scene, a scene, he happened to do a great job. And when you can run the ball well, the line has less to worry about, and your quarterback has more time. The issue that happened last year was Jay Cutler got hurt. Everybody got hurt. Brian Hoyer got hurt. Matt Barkley got hurt. There was no consistency all year, and that's what happened. The defensive backs are going to be revamped. We got a lot more talent up back there. We, if I had to give a draft, all I hear is positives about one of the biggest question marks. Why get a kid from Ashland in the second round? All I hear in training camp is this kid should have been first round material. And quite frankly, I raved about him before the in the pre pre draft or pre combine even. He was a kid I wanted to see. I wanted to see him as a guy who likes to see the little guy succeed. I like seeing these underdog stories. I like seeing the miracles happen for some. I know when we talk professionals, we don't see that a lot, but I like going to college basketball, watching a Florida Gulf Coast somehow make miracles happen and go to the Sweet 16. I like seeing Ohio make it to the Sweet 16, upsetting Georgetown, Michigan, beating UAB, uh, almost beating North Carolina. It's... I like seeing these underdogs succeed, especially even Butler. Uh, even though Butler now, I mean, you can say the Big East isn't what it used to be. And I think it's true. I mean, you look at the landscape of college basketball, like I talked in the last segment, the one and done rule is kind of ruining what college basketball is meant to be. To me, uh, one of my favorite documentaries is the Big East Requiem, where these schools who didn't have a conference decided, well, let's make it a conference. We're all in the we're all independents, and the fact that we can't get in is an issue. So let's have Georgetown and Syracuse and Providence and St. John's and oh yeah, let's throw in some of these other schools. And one of my favorite decisions in college was the Big East deciding, you know, we've been making the choices for all the wrong reasons. Let's stick with basketball. Let the football teams walk. And I thought that was just a great moment for college sports. These schools, Georgetown, Villanova, they're not going to be D1 football. Villanova is a very good FCS football program, but they're not going to be an FBS program. The, I mean, Syracuse jumping off ship was an eye-opener for them. One of the first schools to enter just leaving for the ACC because of that football money. <laughs> I, I, it's true. I I mean, they'll admit it, it's all about the football money. 
Yeah, ACC is also a basketball program with Duke, North Carolina. Wake Forest has some history. North Carolina State has some history. Um, I mean, you can say there's history for any team, honestly. But the ones I named, of course, are the ones people remember. Where I was... <laughs> this odd, odd tangent of Trubisky being the underdog. The Bears making playoffs. Coming full circle. I think what will happen this year is Glennon will be the starter. No ifs, no ands, no buts. Glennon will be the starter. Trubisky will learn. And this time next year, we'll be talking about either how Glennon failed and how Trubisky is going to be the starter. Or we're going to talk about how Glennon succeeded and when it will be Trubisky's time to shine. And I mean, I mean this all. I, I truly believe that the Bears are going to take it slow. The Bears are going to be taking it up a notch this year. They're going to push 500. I truly believe that. I truly believe that the injuries last year is what devastatingly led us to a losing record. Now, I'm not saying Jay Cutler specifically. I'm saying Kyle Long. I'm saying the defensive line, the multiple cornerbacks that went down. That's what killed us. And that's just how it works in life. The last thing before some closing stuff, potentially talking about or hinting at something for next week. The Summer League game happened between the Celtics and the 76ers. If you don't remember from last week, or if you just want to refresh it, these two teams had a trade for the number one pick and third pick. The Celtics fully let go of Fultz because they didn't think he was a winner. And there's been an article really saying they don't think he's a winner because he went 9-22. and 22. Which I would like to mention, <laughs> last week on the show, I said the exact same thing. I don't know if he's a winner. He To be a number one pick, you want to transform a team. And Ben Simmons was able to lead a winning record for LSU, yet they were a subpar 500 team. Man, it's weird to think. I, I'm forgetting some number one picks, but I mean, LeBron James won a state championship. His to be the number one pick. Number three, oh boy, I think it was Dwayne. I would have to look it up. Um, just, I know Carmelo won the championship the same year. I'm trying to think. Normally, you don't see some of the teams get the number one player from the championship team. Uh, Duke's run, I'm pretty sure. Jalil Okafor was the number two pick. He could He was the number one. Mm. I need a refresher on that. As I was saying, I had to look it up for a second. Um, so let's look at some of these names. Kyrie Irving was number one overall pick. He didn't win a championship. Anthony Davis, I'm pretty sure, won a championship with Kentucky to be the number one overall pick. Uh, Andrew Wiggins did not. Anthony Bennett did not. Carl Anthony Towns did not. And Simmons did not. Derrick Rose did not. Blake Griffin did not. I, I'm i looking at these names. Greg Oden, Oden did not. Andre Benarni 
did not. Andrew Bogut did not. Dwight Howard and LeBron James, the last two high school players, uh, LeBron definitely did. I I just don't know because I'm not from Atlanta if he won. So looking at all these other kids, so Greg Oden, Derek Rose, Blake Griffin, Griffin, John Wall, Kyrie Irving, they did not win a NCAA championship. They did not succeed in their quest for championship gold. However, looking at all these, Anthony Bennett was a why was he a number one pick for the Cavaliers? But looking at Ben Simmons and Markel Fultz, it's becoming are they a winner? Are they capable of leading this team? And I both guys, I don't know. Ben Simmons have yet to actually play for the 76ers, Marco Fultz will get to play this year with him. And both will, I'm sure, do spectacular. Now, what got me on this was the Summer League game where Jason Tatum led the Celtics to a win over the 76ers and Fultz. Why is this significant besides the fact that Jason Tatum outperformed Fultz? Well... Who hit the game-winning shot for the Celtics? Oh, yes, it was Jason Tatum. My honest opinion, I thought he would be the number one overall pick, only because of the talent he has. I'm glad he still went to the Celtics. I still think he will be great. As even with Gordon Hayward talking about him earlier, going there, I am ecstatic that Jason Tatum has got a bright future. I think he'll be a power forward for the Celtics, especially with Amir Johnson. I know I didn't talk about him, but he left the Celtics. I, I would have to look, and I can do it real quick, but Amir Johnson left to go play for... He's not the Celtics anymore. Oh, he joined J.J. Redick on the 76ers. Now, why is Amir Johnson such a great pickup? Well, Amir Johnson is a hard-nosed power forward. And with Tatum needing playing time to evolve his game, you're looking at talent that just... It's just going to get better. He can shoot. He can play. He can rebound. His biggest issue is he needs the bulk up. Um, real quick, I just want to go over a few things. Uh, again, these sessions are pre-recorded. If you have questions, please reach out to me. Uh, I will answer them in the video. I will answer you immediately. I will do both. The Q&A sessions, I may... Depending on time and how it's viewed by you, the viewers, I will see how a live Q&A works for this. I will also add it to the beginning of every show. And of course with the magic powerful powers of editing. <laughs> I can easily do that. Um, let's go over, again, like I said, go over a few things. The biggest news today was Joey Chestnut getting 72 hot dogs to win his 10th mustard belt. Uh, the NBA free agencies, the Warriors are staying together. Paul George to the Thunder. Uh, the Houston Rockets got Chris Paul. Minnesota's getting some veterans for their highly touted Team now, uh, JJ Redick and Amir Johnson going to the 76ers. Danilo Gallinari potentially I'm going to be traded to the Clippers. Uh, probably by the end of once I get off here, it will probably be official. Uh, Gordon Hayward is he a Celtic? Is he going back to the Jazz? Is some wild card team going to steal him? Uh, that's for all of you to find out. The AL and NL. 
All stars have been announced. My still prediction AL over the NL team. I'm gonna go 12 to 11. I think it will be close. I think the pitching and offensive talents are very even in both leagues. The biggest surprise this year so far in the MLB, I will say the Cubs not performing up to expectations, the Indians rolling out slow, and the other biggest surprise is how big of a lead the Astros have of the AL West. Uh, I went over the standings. The Red Sox are up three and a half games on the Yankees. The Indians up two and a half. The Astros up 15, the Nationals up 8.5, the Brewers up 2.5, Dodgers up 2.5 also. Went over the Reds, they are a young team, they win at home, they need to find a way to win on the road. Uh, Gronk's logo, too close to Michael Jordan's Jumpman. Personal thoughts, not as close as a legal battle would interpret uh, Jeff Saturday says, let Trubisky compete for the starting job. My feelings, I'm okay with taking it slow. I'm sure he's okay taking it slow, as he's done all his life. The Summer League highlight, Jason Tatum beating Markel Foltz. It is what it is, and it's not going to change anything. Um, something I really wanted to do... Well, just to throw it out there, I know Andrew has asked me about it, talking about it, Colin Kaepernick, big, big hot topic. I once wrote an article for Straight Football Talk that was immediately pulled down later that day due to reasons. Um, I do know my old partner is not comfortable talking about said topic. So let's talk a little bit on the black ball issue. Do I think there's a private campaign against Colin Kaepernick? No. Do I think there's a racial campaign against Colin Kaepernick? No. Our team's not hiring him because of his political views. Yes. Now... That might sound contradictory, but I don't. The reason blackball is a word is because there's a private campaign against you. I don't think it's private at all. I think teams literally know hey, are you more about the social aspect of this? Are you more about the political views than being a starter in the NFL? It's just common topic to think of. And it's common to have those questions, especially with someone who's so passionate about what he talks about, about the injustices on race and other inequalities that being black brings to America. Yes, there's been a lot of highlights where don't shoot, there's been a lot of political movements in the previous presidential regime, and I don't see them needing to slow down. I mean, if you truly believe in this path, I think you should continue it. For Kaepernick to, as I've read, and I do also believe, he needs to accept being a backup before he can be given a starting role again. It's just how it is. It's just how the NFL works. Michael Vick came back after his prison sentence to be a backup for Donovan McNabb before McNabb moved on. And then it was the Michael Vick show for the Eagles. Like I said, this kid just needs to accept a backup role. I know the Seahawks was the team for him. It didn't happen. And most of the people arguing for him are on that team. The, just, the only thing I can say is he does need to make this decision. He has come out and said he he doesn't know if he wants to play in the NFL. 
he kind of, I did post to my personal wall on Facebook about him saying, hey, I just had it with the NFL. It's, it's not uncommon. I think he will get his backup role. I think he needs to embrace it and prove that he can be a starter. I think the reason why he hasn't been good is because of the talent around him. I think there is a market for him. He just needs to prove that he still has a heart in the NFL and wanting to be a game changer, to be the face of the franchise, to be the NFL starting quarterback that we want him to, or not necessarily want him to be. I say that loosely, but GM's owners want him to be a Peyton Manning, a Tom Brady, or even a Joe Flacco if you're a Baltimore Ravens fan. If you're a Steelers fan, Ben Roethlisberger. You want someone who will give you his all. And from the Bears' pers perspective, I, I like to use examples I can relate to. Jay Cutler had a lot of mood issues, and it's just because of the way he acts. There's nothing wrong with it. But when you throw an interception, I don't want you to go over there and go, stone face. I want you to get angry. I want you to get mad. I want you to be in face and tablet. Brian Erlacher recently came out and was like, Jay never had an issue in the locker room. He is one of the guys. He just acts differently. And I think that the media overplayed it. He just does act differently. That's just what happens. I act differently. I went from a kid who could be in your face to a laid back person through sports. It's what happens. A competitive biro is different than the normal biro. <laughs> so, in closing today, I hope you like my little spiel on Kaepernick. I hope you like the show. I it looks like I'm going to be roughly close to an hour, and I feel like hour to an hour and a half. That's again what I wanted to aim for. I didn't do it this week because I wanted to do research. I wanted to do a big spiel about it next week. But I, a former student reached out to me, asked if I could be on his podcast. I said yes. His name is Will Shoemaker. Uh, he brought up some video game topics. As some of you don't know, I'm going to be a tech coordinator for school. I... I'm a, a big video game advocate. I also would like to do a segment on competitive gaming. So next week, I just wanted to throw a little tease about eSports. I'm talking about you Overwatch, talking about you League of Legends, talking about you Hearthstone. I think talking about this stuff will open a few people's eyes because... People think, oh, Call of Duty, oh, Halo. There's a bigger world in esports. And Madden, yeah, it's huge, but have you seen the FIFA tournaments? Have you seen people starve themselves over StarCraft? Have you seen some of the commitment these players have? I will even touch on something I personally like to do. Clash Royale. Pokemon Go, yeah, laugh all you want. Pokemon Go, it could become an eSport. There's gym battles, there's ways to get involved. But we will talk about it next week. Again, my name is Byro. I hope you enjoyed this podcast, vlogcast in some cases. I look forward to talking to you guys next week. I'm proud to